الحمد لله ولي الصالحين أحمده سبحانه حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه مباركا عليه كما يحب ربنا ويرضاه وأصلي وأسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said in his book, وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِنَّ الْخَاسِرِينَ الَّذِينَ خَسِرُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ وَأَهْلِيهِمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ عَلَى ذَلِكَ هُوَ الْخُسْرَانُ الْمُبِينَ لَهُمْ مِنْ فَوْقِهِمْ ظُلَلٌ مِنَ النَّارِ وَمِنْ تَحْتِهِمْ ظُلَلٌ ذلك الذي يخوف الله به عباده يا عبادي فاتقون He said and those who believe they say the verily al khasirin verily the losers are those who lose themselves and their families on the day of judgment indeed that is the clear and manifest loss they will have above them layers of shade of fire as well as below them that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes his believing servants to fear or orders his believing servants to fear ya ibadi fataqun o my believing servants have taqwa of me that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders that his believing servants fear they fear the fire for themselves and that they fear the fire for their families. Ya ibadi fattaqoon. O my servants have taqwa of me. Likewise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَاتَّبَعَتْهُمْ ذُرِيَّتُهُمْ بِإِيمَانِ أَلْحَقْنَا بِهِمْ ذُرِيَّتَهُمْ وَمَا أَلَتْنَاهُمْ مِنْ عَمَالِهِمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ he said that those who believe and whose progeny follow them in their faith, then we will reunite them with their progeny, meaning on the day of judgment. O oh Allah, reunite us with our progeny on the day of judgment. We will reunite them with their progeny, and we will not allow any of their actions to be lost. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu ku anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. O you who believe, save yourselves and your families from the fire. Abdullah ibn Abbas, he said, Ay allimuhum wa addibuhum. That what it means to save yourselves and your families, to save yourselves and your wives and your children from the fire is to teach them their religion and to impart good character to them. To teach them their religion and to teach them good character and good ways and mannerisms. Al-Imam Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala He said فَمَنْ أَحْمَلَ تَعْلِيمَ وَلَدَهِ فَمَنْ أَحْمَلَ تَعْلِيمَ وَلَدِهِ مَا يَنْفَعُهِ وَالتَّرَكَ وَتَرَكَهُ سُدَى فَقَدْ أَسَاءَ إِلَيْهِ غَيَةَ الْإِسَاءَ He said that the person who neglects teaching his child that which will benefit them and leaves them without instruction, then they have mistreated their child to the highest level. Then they have mistreated their child to the highest level. وَأَكْثَرُ الْأَوْلَادِ إِنَّمَا جَاءَ فَسَادُهُ مِنْ قِبَلِ الْأَبَاءِ وَإِهْمَالِهِمْ لَهُمْ وَالتَّرْكِ تَعْلِيمِهِمْ فَرَائِذَ الدِّينِ وَسُنَنَهِ He said, and the majority of children are only corrupted on account of their parents. The majority of children are only corrupted on account of their parents. And their parents neglecting them and not teaching them the obligations of the religion and the extra obligatory acts of the religion. 
فأضاعوهم صغارا فلم ينتفعوا بأنفسهم ولم ينفعوا آباءهم كبارا He said to the extent that they will have squandered their children while they were young and they will not, meaning their children will not benefit from their own selves, from their lives that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them as an opportunity to come close to him and to work for his paradise, subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will not have benefited from their own selves and they will not be of a benefit from their parents when they are older. كَمَا عَاتَبَ بَعْضُهُمْ وَلَدَهُ عَلَى الْعُقُوقِ As it was mentioned that a child was reprimanded by or that a person was reprimanded, reprimanded by their parent for their mistreatment of their parent. فَقَالَ يَا أَبَتِ إِنَّكَ عَقَقْتَنِي صَغِيرًا فَعَقَقْتُكَ كَبِيرًا And he said, Oh my father, you mistreated me when I was young, and so I mistreat you when you're old. Oh, my father, you mistreated me when I was young, and so I mistreat you now that I'm old. And you wasted and neglected me when I was a child, and so now that you are an old man, I will neglect you. Brothers and sisters, a messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said in a hadith of Ma'qil ibn Yasar, رضي الله تعالى عنه وأرضاه. He said, ما من عبد يسترعيه الله رعية يموت يوم يموت وهو غاش لرعيته إلا حرم الله عليه الجنة. That there is no person that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives responsibility over another who dies in a day that they die while they are neglecting those that are under their care except that Allah will forbid the paradise for them. We live in a time of many trials. Trials that destroy the religion of a person. Trials that dis- destroy the character of a person. Trials that destroy the minds of people. Trials and tests and calamities and afflictions that destroy al-arad, that destroy the reputations of individuals and families. Trials that are destroying al-ibad wal-bilad, that are destroying the worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the earth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Trials that have caused humiliation to fall upon the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and has caused the enemies of Islam to gain an advantage over the Muslims and humiliate them. A time of fitna, of doubts that lead people astray and desires that tempt people. The fitna of magazines and television and social networking, and the satellite dish, and the movie theater, the fitna of lewdness of the woman, and they're not covering their nakedness, the fitna of al of free mixing between the sexes, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا اختلات. And we'll let you know the reality and the severity of free mixing between the sexes. Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala he said in his book, Ilam al Muwaqi'een, that the awliya al umur, that those who are the guardians and are responsible for the affairs of others, allowing the woman to intermingle and free mix with the men, sababu nuzul al uqubat al ama, is the causes of destruction to descend upon entire societies of people. We live in a time of shamelessness where people communicate with the other sex in a manner that is not permissible. We live in a time of fitna concerning what is broadcast by way of that which is heard and by way of that which is seen. Fitna of the youth having forbidden sexual contact with one another. 
the fitna of fitness centers, and nightclubs and movie theaters, fitna at the parks and fitna at the beaches, the fitna of instant messengers, the fitna of having bad friends and evil associates, the fitna of intoxicants and alcohol, to the extent that the parent finds herself like a shepherd driving their flock through a field full of wild beasts and predators. And so it is upon the Muslims individually. And it is upon the Muslims at the family level. And it is upon the Muslims at the community level to strengthen themselves and not to allow for their people to be lost and to call those that have been bit and poisoned and harmed and deluded by the shaitan and deluded by their nafs al amarati bisu their souls that order them with evil and deluded by the dunya to call them back to repentance and not to leave our folk wandering about without a purpose mistreating the children that are born in a situation forbidden by the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ignoring them leaving our brothers and our sisters who are like infants brand new to the religion once they fall into major sins abandoning the people mistreating the people the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said in the hadith of Abid Darda reported by Ahmed and Abu Dawood and Nasai in Sunan Al-Kubra and by Ibn Hibban in his Sahih and by Al-Hakim in his, in his Mustadrak he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ما من ثلاثة في قرية ولا في بدو لا تقام فيهم الصلاة إلا استحوذ عليهم الشيطان فعليكم بالجماعة فعليكم بالجماعة فإنما يأكل ذعب من الغنم القاسية The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم He said there are no three persons in a town or in the habitations outside of the villages and towns in the wilderness and the outskirts who the Salat is not established amongst except that the shaitan will gain dominance over those people. And the point of the hadith is the next statement, فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِالْجَمَعَةِ So I advise you to stick close to the jama'ah, to the body of believers. فَإِنَّمَا يَأْكُلُ الذِّعْبُ مِنَ الْغَنَمِ الْقَاسِيَةِ because the wolf only eats the stray sheep. Because the wolf only eats the stray sheep. And so the people find themselves in a time, and we find ourselves in a time, in which we fear tremendously for our children. We fear tremendously for ourselves. As Abu Darda, he said, لا تأمن البلاء Do not feel safe in being tested. فَوَاللَّهِ إِنَّ الرَّجُلْ لا يفتن في ساعة واحدة فينقلب عن دينه. For verily a man could be put to test at any given moment with a test that may make the, that may cause him to leave their religion. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has given us the solution for every sickness and every trial that we are tested with or afflicted with. As the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "ما أنزل الله داء إلا أنزل الله له شفاء." Allah has not sent down any sickness or illness except that He has sent down His cure. We have a number of verses in Surah Al Furqan that we can say without exaggeration. If we were to incorporate the meanings of these verses within ourselves and our households, we will see that which would please us tremendously. And it will be the solution for many of the problems that we face. These verses in Surah Al-Furqan, they demonstrate to us that from the description of the believer, 
is that they are more concerned with guidance and education than they are with entertainment and idle talk. The fitan that we mentioned, the trials that we mentioned that the youth go through, and that some of those who are a little older go through, and many of those who are older go through, it comes on account of the people being more concerned with entertaining themselves and enjoying themselves with false entertainment and idle talk than their concern for educating themselves and their concern for guidance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said, describing the believers, وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَشْهَدُونَ الزُّورِ وَإِذَا مَرُّوا بِاللَّغْوِ مَرُّوا كِرَامَ That they are those who do not witness. They are those that do not take part in. They are those who are not to be found. They are not found present. And they do not bear witness to falsehood. And they do not participate in falsehood. And they do not bear witness to falsehood. And when they pass by a lagu, when they pass by idle speech, then they pass by kirama with dignity. وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِّرُوا بِآيَاتِ رَبِّهِمْ لَمْ يَخِرُّوا عَلَيْهَا صُمًّا وَعُمْيَانًا And they are those that when they are reminded of the verses and evidences of their Lord, they do not fall upon them deaf and blind. وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا هَبْلَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَّتِنَا قُرَّةَ عَيُّنْ وَجْعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا And they are those that say, O oh, our Lord, bestow and bless upon us, bless us with and bestow upon us the coolness of our eyes and make us the coolness of our eyes to our wives and our children and make us leaders for the righteous. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these verses He has informed us that the believers, when they pass by Azur, when they pass by falsehood, the ulama, they say what is meant by Azur, and, he, or they, and he, that they do not bear witness to falsehood, and they are not present during falsehood, and do not participate and partake in falsehood. The ulama, they say that what is meant by Azur is al qawlul muharram wal fi'lul muharram are forbidden statements and forbidden actions. That they are not to be found in places where what is being haram is uttered and what is being haram is done. And likewise, when they pass by a lagu, they pass by with dignity. A lagu, the ulama, they say a lagu is kullul qawl, لا خير كل قول لا خير فيه ولا فائدة دينية ولا دنيوية. Is every statement that has no good in it or any benefit pertaining a person's religion or a person's worldly affairs. And so we ask a question that isn't the majority of what is found on the television and the majority of what is found on the internet. And the majority of what is found in social networking, and the majority of what we find in the conversations of people over their telephones and their cell phones, and in private and in public, cannot the majority of it be described as a zur and a lagu, as false speech and false behavior? And that which has no benefit, or that which has no benefit to it. The ulama of Islam, they have a principle that says, "Ma amar Allah illa ma maslahatuhu khalisa aw rajiha." That Allah has not ordered anything except that which has a pure, overwhelming benefit, and has not forbidden anything. Wa ma naha illa amma mafsadatuhu. Khalisa aw rajiha, and has not forbidden anything except for that which has pure or overwhelming harm. So anything that the harm of it, 
outweighs the benefit of it is forbidden in the religion. Perhaps something may be permissible for one person and impermissible for another person. Because the benefit that one person gets from that thing outweighs the harm of that thing. And another person may use the exact same thing. You have an MP3 player. One person is listening to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One person is listening to الدروس العلمية. One person is listening to the translations of the lectures of the ulama or the lectures of the ulama directly. Another person is using it to listen to every any kullu man habba wa dab, any every fool that has fallen off of the bus and got a record contract. So pertaining one person, it's recommended, or at least permissible, for him to have this device. And pertaining another person, it is absolutely forbidden for him to have this device. To the point that the ulama, they say, in ahkam al-buyur, in the rulings pertaining al-buyur, when they mention shurut, sihatul bay'ah, Need the conditions of a valid business transaction. That from the conditions of a valid business transaction is that the thing that is being sold or bought, the thing that is being sold or bought cannot be used i'anatun al munkar. It cannot be used to aid a person in munkar. So a person is a merchant. And they have an electrical device that they know if they sell it to a kafir, what the kafir is going to do with it. If they sell it to a weak Muslim, they know what the weak Muslim is going to do with it. But if they sell it to a believer, they know what the believer is going to do with it. The point is that according to the situation of a person and according to the deen of a person, these things can take different rulings. We say in general, the vast majority of the ulama say the television is impermissible for many, many reasons. But then we take something else that is a little bit more vague, like the internet. And we have a fatwa from some of the ulama, such as the Shaykh Saleh al-Fawzan, who said that it is forbidden for the person to bring the internet into his home. Now we ask, is it forbidden for the person to bring, in general, is it forbidden for the person to bring the internet into his home? La. But what did the shaykh say after he said this statement? He said, because the abundance of the mafasid, the abundance of the harms that can be found within it. So what the shaykh is seeing from a majority of people in his land, from, or a large number of people, is that there are many people without a doubt that the reason why they use the internet, that the harm of it far outweighs the benefit. The ulama is saying now that the kuffar have found a way to overthrow entire nations without saying an army. They have studied the minds of the people and the emotions of the people and sent armies of social scientists into the lands of the Muslims for decades. And they found a large portion of disaffected, unemployed, poor youth. Whose minds they could affect. And who they could use as a tool to overthrow the governments of multiple Muslim nations. All of this was orchestrated with two things. What you see right now. A vast majority, what happened in Egypt in particular, was orchestrated with the news and Facebook. The news and Facebook. And so the ruling of a thing, it can take a turn, it can change according to the situation of the person. 
the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said in the hadith of Urs ibn Amirah al-Kindi, he said, إِذَا عُمِلَتَ الْخَطِيعَةُ فِي الْأَرْضِ كَانَ مَنْ شَهِدَهَا فَكَرِهَهَا وَقَالَ مَرَّةً أَنْكَرَهَا كَمَنْ غَابَ عَنْهَا وَمَنْ غَابَ عَنْهَا فَرَضِيَهَا كَانَ كَمَنْ شَهِدَهَا The Prophet sallallahu wa sallam, he said that when an act of disobedience is committed in the earth, then the person who, then the person who is present when it is committed, but he dislikes it, is like the person who wasn't there to begin with. And in one wording he said, فَأَنْكَرَهَا And he speaks against it or does something about it. And he was like the person who wasn't present when it occurred. And he said, and the person who was absent from it, but was pleased that it occurred, then he is like the one who was present. The ulama of tafsir, they say, as was mentioned by Al-Mubarak Puri in his explanation of the Tirmidhi, and was mentioned by Al-Munawi in his book, Faith Al-Qadir, the explanation of Al-Jami Al-Saghir, that what this hadith means, and man ghaba anha faradiyaha, kana kaman shahidaha, that the person who was absent, but he was pleased that some munkar occurred, and he was like the person who was present when it occurred. He said, ay fi fil musharakati fil ithm, meaning that they share in the sin, that they share in the sin, the person who was pleased with disobedience, and he shares in the sin of that disobedience. وَإِنْ بَعُدَتَ الْمَسَافَةُ بَيْنَهُمَا Even if the distance between them and the offense that was committed was very far. If they are pleased with the sin, then they take a portion of this, and they take a portion of that sin. He said, لِأَنَّ الرَّاضِي بِالْمَعْصِيَةِ فِي حُكْمِ الْعَاسِي لِأَنَّ الرَّاضِي بِالْمَعْصِيَةِ فِي حُكْمِ الْعَاسِي because a person who was pleased with the act of disobedience takes the same ruling as a person who committed the act of disobedience. فَالْإِنْكَارُ بِالْقَلْبِ فَرْضٌ عَيْنَ لَكُلِّ مُسْلِمْ فِي كُلِّ حَال And so it is mandatory for the Muslim to hate evil in his heart, no matter what the situation. And so the person who watches television and watches movies and the person who wastes their time with that which will not benefit them in social networking and so on and so forth. Me reading about the sins of people. Me reading the conversations of people that have no benefit. Reading the backbiting and the tail carrying of people. And this person without a doubt may take a portion of the sin. Some people have a weak excuse and they say, that there is some good in having a television. There is some good in having a cable subscription. They say, we watch the Discovery Channel. We watch the Travel Channel. We watch the news. We watch this, we watch that, and the third. And so there is some good in it. And we say that the excuse of this person for possessing and having a television in their home that in many cases is made accessible to the children of the home to watch unrestrictedly while the person is away or while they are present. That the excuse of this person is like the excuse of any foolish person who tries to justify their sin and come up with some good aspects of why they do what they do. The person he smokes cigarettes or she smokes cigarettes and anybody who is afflicted with that, we ask Allah to cure them. The person smokes cigarettes. And they say that if they don't smoke, they're going to be stressed out. I'm going to end up putting my hands on somebody. I'm going to get upset with my wife. I might end up being violent towards my wife or my child or so on and so forth. And so I need to smoke to calm myself down. Is that an excuse for the person? 
ابدا كوسنا the person they say any any sin that you can imagine a person can find some good aspects or what they think are good aspects or they can try to rationalize and justify their sin is there any benefit in alcohol it's a question is there any benefit in alcohol is there who agrees with him you agree there's benefit in alcohol about gambling there be a benefit in gambling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he said in his book يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنَ الْخَمْرِ وَالْمَيْسِرِ قُلْ فِيهِمَا إِثْمٌ كَبِيرٌ وَمَنَافِعُ لِلنَّاسِ وَإِثْمُهُمَا أَكْبَرُ مِنْ نَفْعِهِمَا They ask you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, pertaining al-khamr wal-maysir. Concerning alcohol, liquor, and gambling. Say to them, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, فِيهِمَا إِثْمٌ كَبِيرٌ ومناف... في... فيهما إثم كبير ومنافع للناس Say to them that within the both of them is an enormous sin and transgression and many benefits or and benefits for people Khamar it was forbidden in the fifth year after the hijra while the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was fighting against Banu Nadir. The prohibition of Khamr came down in stages. This was one of the verses that was revealed before the final prohibition of Khamr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentioned that the person, that the person that they incur a sin upon themselves, that there is a great sin within them and there are benefits. Or this was from the final prohibition rather of Khamr. That there is a great sin in it and there are also benefits. But what? But the sin outweighs the benefit. The harm outweighs the benefit. And so anything that the harm outweighs the benefit of is forbidden in the religion. Let's look at some of the harms individually. Let's look at some of the harms of television. And we're going to choose a television more than everything else. Because the television has crept back into the homes, has crept back into the homes of many people. Why? Because they didn't find a viable solution. Why? Has it crept back into the homes of many people? Because perhaps the reason that they left it wasn't a sincere reason. Perhaps it was just for face. Because it became unpopular amongst many people and it became something that was scorned by many people to have a television in the home. And it was spoken about some years ago on, a number, on numerous occasions and people started to feel uncomfortable having televisions in their home and so it left. And perhaps some people, they just, le- they just left it to save face. But the television has crept back into the homes of many people. It was stated by Muhammad ibn Sirin. He says, سَمِعْتُ شُرَيْحَنَ القاضي يقول he said, I heard Shurayh al-Qadi saying, Wallahi ma taraka ahadun shayin illah, thumma yajidu faqdahu. He said, I swear by Allah, that no one ever abandons something for the sake of Allah, and then feels as though they miss it. I swear by Allah, that no one ever leaves something for the sake of Allah, and then feel as though they miss it. Meaning that if a person was to leave something for the sake of Allah, if a person was to leave a thing rather and then feel as though that they missed it some time later, then it showed that there was some insincerity in the reason why they left that thing. So we want to mention some of the harms, some of the greatest harms of television. And the internet. And everything connected to that. The first of these harms 
is that it is busying the mind with that which has no benefit. Is this serious? To busy the mind with that which has no benefit. Is this a serious thing or not? How serious is it? The behavior of a person. Where does it start? So the person's thoughts, what they think about, it creates with them, it creates within them, their himma, and their determination, their aspiration, so on and so forth. And when a person wants to do a thing, when a person aspires to do a thing, that becomes an action. And when an action is done constantly and repetitively, that becomes a habit. And once a thing is a habit, it's almost impossible to leave for most people. Where did it start? Not with a person's thoughts. Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he said in his book, Al-Fawa'id, he said, أَتَفَكُّرُوا فِي مَا لَا يَعْنِي بَابُ كُلِّ شَرْ أَتَفَكُّرُوا فِي مَا لَا يَعْنِي بَابُ كُلِّ شَرْ That thinking about what does not benefit a person is the gateway and doorway to every evil. Thinking about what does not benefit the person is the gateway and doorway to every evil. So here you have a statement from a alim Rabbani, Shaykh al Islam Uthani, fi waqtihi wa asrihi, the one who was called Shaykh al Islam number two in his time, the student of Shaykh al Islam number one in his time, Shaykh al Islam ibn Utaymi rahimahullah, ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, telling you and me and our children. That thinking about what doesn't benefit you is the doorway to every evil. So the person busying their mind with that which does not benefit them is a tremendous harm. Likewise, from the harms of television, the internet, and busying oneself with false entertainment and that which does not benefit them is that it contributes to laziness and indolence. Alaysa kadhalik? That's true, right? And when you have a person who sits watching the television for hours on end, sitting on the internet for hours on end, wasting their time on Facebook for hours on end, doesn't that contribute to laziness? How big of a problem is laziness? The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as was reported by Anas ibn Malik, he said, Kuntu asma'uhu kathiran yaqul. He said, I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, very frequently he used to say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allahumma inni ya'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-hazani wal-ajaz wal-kasal wal-bukhli wal-jubni wal-dala' al-dayn wa ghalabat al-rijal. I heard the Prophet wasallam seek refuge from the following things frequently. We're going to mention all of these things and then say that aren't all of these things are a majority of these things. Big problems in our communities. O Allah, I seek your refuge from al-hammi wal-hazan. From grief and sadness. Aren't there many people in our communities who are suffering from psychological problems? Are there many people in our community suffering from psychological problems? Suffering from depression and sorrow and grief and so on and so forth? It's rampant. It's very widespread. Wal-ajazi wal-kasal. And from helplessness and laziness. That's a big problem. Wal-bukhli wal jubun and from cowardice and greed. How big of an issue is cowardice and greed? And we're going to get back to laziness, right? Cowardice and greed, the Prophet وسلم, he said, he said, شَرٌ مَا فِي الرَّجُلْ جُبْنٌ خَالِعٌ وَبُخْلٌ هَالِعٌ He said, the worst qualities that can be found in a man are unnerving cowardice and anguished greed. 
unnerving cowardice, and he was a person that's so afraid that they that their feet can't move. As Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentioned in his section about courage in his book al furusiya he said, Al-Jabbanu yafirru min ummihi. He said that the coward would flee from defending his own mother. وَالشَّجَاعُ يُقَاتِلُ عَمَّا لَا يَعْلَمْ While the courageous person would fight to defend people he don't even know. The Prophet ﷺ, he said the worst qualities in a man are unnerving cowardice and anguish greed. So these are from the eight things that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned. Likewise, he said, I'm being overcome by debt and overcome by men. Aren't there many people? Isn't there an entire system in this country in place to keep everybody in debt? And aren't there many people who are overcome by other human beings? Aren't there a great number of our brothers in the penal system? So these eight things that were sought refuge from by the Prophet wasallam. Listen to what Ibn Qayyim says about them. He said after mentioning Al-Ajazu wal kasal Helplessness and laziness. Because that's the point that we're trying to make. <clears throat> he said after mentioning helplessness and laziness, he said, وَهُمَا مِفْتَاحُ كُلِّ شَرِّ وَيَسْدُرُ عَنْهُمَا الْهَمُّ وَالْحَزَنُ وَالْجُبْنُ وَالْبُخْلُ وَضَلَعُ الدَّيْنُ وَغَلَبَةُ الرِّجَالِ فَمَصْدَرُهَا كُلُّهَا عَنْ الْعَجَزِ وَالْكَسَلِ He said all these things that we just mentioned that are big problems that we face in our communities. He said that helplessness and laziness, that they are the key to every evil. They are the key to every evil. And their results from helplessness and laziness, the other six things that I mentioned in the hadith. The cause of a person's sadness and the cause of their distress and the cause of a majority of their problems on account of their being lazy. Procrastinating to tomorrow what they should have done today, they were lazy. And now they're worried and sad and stressed out because they knew they had a light bill to pay and they knew it was $100 last month and or it was $100 in January and it was 150 added to that in February. And now they have a bill for $1,000 that they could have paid off, but because they were too lazy to pick up the phone. Uh, they got to borrow some money or they got to sit in the dark with cold water. Right? Comes from what? Comes from laziness. Comes from laziness. The issue of laziness is a tremendous issue. So if we say that the likes of these things, television, social media, the internet, so on and so forth. These things when they are mismanaged, and these things when a person is obsessive concerning them and wastes their time concerning them, that they contribute to laziness, then we say that laziness is a source of a majority of our problems. And so, these things are a source of a majority of our problems. Many people are overweight. Many people have health problems on account of these sorts of things. Laziness, just sitting around indolent. Tayyip, likewise from the ills of these things as they weaken the mind. According to the strength of the intellect of a person will be how much they benefit from their religion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said, وَمَا يَذَكَّرُوا إِلَّا أُولُوا الْأَلْبَابِ That no one benefit from the reminders except for people who, who possess intellect. People who possess and have been endowed with intelligence. Likewise, he said in many places in his book, إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتِ لِقَوْمٍ يَعْقِلُونَ That indeed within that are signs for people who have intelligence. Likewise, he said, تَبَارَكُ وَتَعَالَى لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَةٌ لِأُولُوا الْأَلْبَابِ that indeed in their stories and the stories of the prophets and the messengers of Allah, alayhim salatu wasalam, is a clear lesson for people who have intelligence. 
So the people who benefit from the orders of Allah and the prohibitions of Allah and the belief concerning Allah and the Day of Judgment that can be found in the text of the Kitab and the Sunnah and the person who benefits from the stories of the Prophets and the Messengers of Allah alayhim salatu wa salam is a person who has intelligence and the likes of these things destroy the intelligence. So the likes or so the person who busies himself with the likes of these things you find that he doesn't enjoy reading the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He doesn't enjoy sitting in lectures. He doesn't enjoy learning beneficial knowledge. He doesn't enjoy that which the person who has strong faith benefits from. It was said by Abu al-Ala, Yazid ibn Abdullah al-Shikhir. He said, Ma'utiya abdun. بعد الإسلام أفضل من عقل صالح يرزقه. He said that the servant of Allah subhanahu wa taala, after being guided to Islam, is not bestowed anything that is more virtuous and better for him than a strong intellect. And it was said to Abdullah bin Al Mubarak. They said, "What is the best thing a person can have after Islam?" He said, "عقلٌ." He said, "Aqlun, gharis." He said, "To have a strong mind is the best thing you can have after Islam." And so, the person, according to the strength of his intellect, he will benefit from his religion. If these things were the only problems that could be found in wasting one's time with the likes of these things, these things that we mentioned, and the internet and the television and so on and so forth, that will be enough of a problem. They weaken the mind of a person. They cause a person to be lazy. They cause a person's mind to be consumed and obsessed with that which will not benefit them. All these things are tremendous in their harm. But the harm of these things is much worse than any of this. We live in a time where there is a campaign of misinformation and misdirection and miseducation. We live in a time about which the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, سَيَكُونُ بَيْنَ يَدَّيْ دَجَّالِ سَنَوَاتٌ خَدَّعَاتٌ يُصَدَّقُ فِيهَا الْكَاذِبُ وَيُكَذَّبُ فِيهَا الصَّادِقُ وَيُؤْتَمَنُ فِيهَا الْخَائِنُ وَيُخَوَّنُ فِيهَا الْأَمِينُ That there will come before the emergence of the Antichrist. Years, khadda'at, years of deception, in which the liar will be believed and the truthful person will be disbelieved. And the treacherous one will be deemed to be trustworthy and the trustworthy will be deemed to be treacherous. وَيَنْتِقُوا فِيهَا الرَّوَيْبِضَى And the rawaybida will speak at that time. And the Prophet was described as a rajalu tafi yatakallamu fi amr al-ama, the ignoble person who speaks about those affairs that pertain the masses of Muslims concerning safety and concerning the management of the society and so on and so forth. We live in a time that is like that, where everything that is beneficial is uglified in the eyes of the people and everything that is harmful is beautified in the eyes of the people. And there is ghazwun fikri, there is an ideological war there is an ideological war that is more dangerous than a war waged with weapons of mass destruction. There is an ideological war that is charted over the hearts and the minds of every human being on the face of the earth. There is an ideological war that the ulama of Islam have spoken about in great detail and warned about in great detail to the extent that it was made its own subject matter to be researched and studied in the faculty of Dawah in the University of Medina for the people to understand the reality of the ideological war. There are entire books consisting of hundreds of pages documenting and elaborating exactly how this war is being waged and the extreme danger of it. This war didn't begin yesterday. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentioned in Surah Al-Luqman, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَشْتَرِ لَهُ الْحَدِيثِ لِيُضِلَّ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ بِغَيْرِ عِلْمِ وَيَتَّخِذَهَا هُزُوَا أُولَٰئِكَ لَهُمْ عَذَابٌ مُّهِينٌ that from the people are those who purchase vain talk. Qatada rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, it doesn't mean necessarily that a person spends his money on lahw al-hadith, on vain talk. What is vain talk? Ibn Abbas, he said that it is, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he said that it is singing, I swear by Allah, alladhi la ilaha illahu. Abdullah ibn Abbas, he said that there was a man named another ibn al-Harith from the Mushrikun of Quraysh that was a Tajir. And he used to go to the lands of Al-Faris wa Rum, of the Persians and the Romans, and he would purchase their literature. He would purchase their books that had their stories about the kings of the Persians and the kings of the Romans and their battles and their and anything else you could imagine romance, so on and so forth, he would bring these back to Mecca. And while the messenger of Allah sallallahu was teaching the people the religion, he would say, don't listen to this. These are asatir al These are the stories of the ancients. We didn't heard these stories before. I got something brand new. I got something brand new for you. And he would stand next to the Kaaba. And a large crowd would amass their self. And in one narration, they said that another Ibn al-Harith, that he purchased a beautiful slave woman to sing to the people. So he had live entertainment in the shade of the Kaaba. As sometimes a live singer, as sometimes the stories of yani, the akhbar, yani, the news, What's going on with the Persians and the Romans and blase, blase? You find many Muslims today that have that same type of mentality. That instead of going and looking in the Quran and benefiting from what is in the Quran and looking at the ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ and enjoying that, as the Prophet wasallam, he said, Man humani la yashba'an. That there are two thirsts that can never be quenched. Man humun fil ilmi la yashba' wa man humun fil dunya la yashba'. That a thirst for knowledge can never be satisfied and a thirst for the dunya can never be satisfied. And says so that that person having that thirst and that love for hearing the Quran and it says of our children having that love for reciting the Quran. Our Muslim children in the in front of the masjid beatboxing, singing the lyrics of Jay-Z and 50 Cent and Lil Wayne and whoever else is out there. You have Muslim children singing songs, not even know what they're saying. While you have some righteous families, walillahi alhamd, who have taken that master out of their home. And their children are in the halaqat al-tahfid, making us very happy. Reciting the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way that brings tears to your eyes. Walking about in the hallways of the schools and in the musalla of the masajid, reciting the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just because they love the way it sounds. And so this is lahul hadith. And anything, Shaykh Abdul Rahman al-Sa'adi, when he mentioned the explanation of lahul hadith in his tafsir, and he mentioned that it is anything, it is anything that has no benefit that a person busies themselves with to entertain themselves. So this is when a thing doesn't have benefit. What about when a thing is extremely harmful? Qatada, we said, he said it doesn't mean necessarily that the person that they spend their money, that the people are spending their money. 
doesn't mean, mean necessarily the person spends their money. He said, but what is meant in this verse? وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَشْتَرِي لَهُ الْحَدِيثِ from the people are those who purchase vain talk, is that they love it so much that if it had a price tag on it, they would pay for it. If we were to look at the entertainment budget of the Muslims, what is spent monthly for that which is clearly haram, to attend a movie, some people even take their families, and we don't want to spread su and fahsha amongst the people. But it's not a secret. It's not a secret. And he, it's not a secret when you walk into the homes of many Muslims and you see huge plasma screen TVs on the walls of many people. Where is the shame? Where is the shyness? How much did that thing cost? That plasma Screen TV, that huge 53-inch plasma screen TV that's on the wall. How much did that cost? Six, seven, eight hundred dollars? Now imagine, if that entertainment budget went to support a da'wah ilallahi azza wa jal. No. You won't even go there. As far as if the entertainment budget of the Muslims was to go to support the masajid. And the dawah. We won't even go there. If the people spent the same time that they spend in front of the boob tube in the classes in the masajid. Have so many masajid all across this country where the people are teaching the people day and night that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed them to understand of the religion. And you have one, two, three people who come regularly. And about a third of those people, they're only there to be polite. They don't want to just walk out. Right? Now imagine if the people were to spend the same type of time and give the same type of interest to learning their religion and educating themselves and being educated and being guided, have the same desire for guidance that they have for entertainment. Imagine what that do to our community. Imagine our communities in this country. If we were to take that mentality, we would see that which would please us without a doubt. But the people are bored in their mentality. And the people are bored with knowledge. We'll close with this. هذا هو صلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم.